journalism is under attack like never before. Oh, no, hostage being tear gas fired. You have to have the facts. Beautiful, but tragic. Because people are doubting everything. You're the only way of telling their story. How would you describe this outbreak? Something like an apocalypse. You're going to be really tired. You're going to be really scared. It's too dangerous, yeah. Anyone who says they're not scared is lying. Anything can happen. Did you get hit? I sometimes wonder, how have we managed to get out of this? People being killed. We do genuinely believe in what we do. He's clearly marked his press. To show the truth. Wow, this is absolutely unbelievable. To uncover an injustice. This is the result yeah. of ethnic cleansing. I don't think any journalist wants anything more than that. I'm Alex Crawford. I'm Stuart Ramsey. And this is Hotspots. Coming up on Hotspots. This is a fight. My team is in Kenya, investigating the plastic pollution in the waters of Africa. A whole industry is going to die. We've just scraped the surface. There's still loads out there. The wind is up. It's really dangerous. And I'm in the Amazon, where fires are destroying the landscape and livelihoods with devastating effect. They're going to need reinforcements. This is hopeless here. These guys, five of them, can't take on this number of fires. It was an island of plastic. Oh, oh my God, that's disgusting. It's choking life. We understand you're manufacturing illegal plastic bags here. What is it we're waiting for? It's a dying leak. So Sky's been running this ocean rescue campaign for many years now, examining the level of plastic pollution in oceans. And we thought, well, as rivers flow into oceans, what's happening to the rivers? Looking at how fresh water in Africa was affected by microplastics, tiny bits of plastic, fragments of plastic, getting into the water and then getting into fish and the food chain. It was a huge undertaking, the, the whole project, many different countries involved. We set out to find out how much plastic there was in the longest river in the world, the River Nile. And one of the countries that we focused on was Kenya. Africa, it's just an incredibly visual feast of wildlife and fantastic scenery to film at any time. Kenya, in particular, is rich in colour and there's beauty everywhere you point your camera. This was my first time actually discovering the heart of Africa. It's just a beautiful place to work. Lake Victoria is one of the big wonders of Africa. It's the largest freshwater lake in Africa, and it is huge. It's an amazing place. We knew plastic pollution was a real issue there. The aim was to, in some ways, expose this sort of underbelly of the nasty side of plastic. What you're seeing everywhere is disposable nappies, sunny pads, bottles, condoms, all sorts of things. Lake Victoria is one of the main sources of the River Nile, and everything that ends up in Lake Victoria ends up being fed into the River Nile. And it's not very obvious at the beginning because you just don't see it. All you see is lots of water and lots of foliage along the riverbanks. Plastic is the number one problem around this place, especially the bottles. Can look at that. What's this? Yeah. Within minutes, we've got loads and loads of, of plastic. It's a small tributary leading to Lake Victoria, and it was just clogged with plastic. You haven't got to go very far to gather boatloads of this stuff, and it just gets washed out and sinks and breaks apart, and it's just all hidden, and, and there's tons and tons of it. This is just 
tiny portion of what we've picked out. Look, all this partially disintegrated plastic bags. There's old nappies. There's bottles. Look at all these bottles in what about 20 minutes or so. And actually, we've just scraped the surface. There's still loads out there. In Lake Victoria, basically everyone who lives around the shores, that's millions of people, they rely on fish. And what we were hearing was that those supplies of fish are dwindling in a really severe manner. And plastic is one of the major causes for that. Fishing crews have to go out all night. So the sort of things we're slightly concerned about are uh, obviously, crocodiles, hippos, everything's a bit more dangerous at night. We've just no idea what we're going to see, really, if we're going to see many boats, if the camera can pick them up, because it's obviously pitch black here. Keep uh, the water clean. Tom Mboya was basically a local hero. Yeah. He's been fishing since he was a boy. He's born and brought up around that area. He's turned into an environmental warrior because from very early on, he realized there were big changes happening right in front of him. It's another boat there, but it's too dark. We've got a mission. Yeah, it's not quite as simple as just drifting out to sea, is it? We were just heading off into the middle of this lake on this slightly rickety fishing boat. Fast speed of the Ambo. Okay, be prepared. Fishermen have these lights that float above the surface. The fish has been attracted to that light. They're all going out in small numbers in these little canoe boats, spreading a huge net, and then they pull it in by hand, really exhausting physical work. We were expecting you know, tons of fish to be hauled up, but actually what they brought up was pathetic. Is that considered a good haul or a this little is haul? a very poor haul. Mm. The haul of fish they are catching is getting less and less over time. This is really, really poor and pathetic. So I purely blame it on plastics. Tom was sounding the alarm bell. You can see plastic. Very obvious. Look at that, that's plastic in the middle of nowhere. In those areas along those poor coastal regions, fishing will be the livelihood that sustains whole communities, literally millions of people. Plastic is overwhelming the fish. My greatest fear is that a whole industry is going to die and with it, quite a number of people because without money, no life. Without food, no life. And that's the saddest that I feel about this lake. He's not just concerned about how small the fish are and how much fewer fish there are. He's concerned about the health because if the fish are ingesting plastic, sooner or later, that's going to come home to roost. The suggestion is that by eating a fish which may have contained fragments of plastic, that then is then getting into the human food chain or other predators are consuming it, and then it continues. It's a dying lake. If nothing is done about it from now. The fishermen had been out all night, so it was very early in the morning. The place was already thronging with people. Everyone was crowded round trying to get the best deal. Bartering for how much and who gets the best, biggest fish here or a little small fry here. Sifting through huge buckets of fish that had just been brought in from Lake Victoria. Was this a good catch for them? For us, it looked like a huge amount of fish that was being brought in. Sometimes we get more. But, you know, we were being told, this isn't much fish, this isn't going to be enough to, to earn enough money. 2,000, between four people. Tom had told us that underneath Lake Victoria was a bed of plastic. It was a plastic island. 
And the only way of testing that was to go down and see if there was plastic on the bottom of Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is considered one of the most dangerous bodies of water in the world, based on the number of people who've died in it. It's got hippos, which are considered very dangerous. They uh, apparently kill more people than other predators do. It's got crocodiles. It's got really high levels of at least three dangerous metals. So there were quite a lot of considerations about getting into that water. We met up with Ryla, whose normal day job was searching for dead bodies. He will dive if someone's gone missing and try and find the body. That's what he does. He's a body collector. Raila exuded security and confidence. He clearly knew his way around the waters. So we knew that there were hippos down the corner. We knew that the place was filled with crocodiles. Yeah, yeah, there is no, no crocodile right now. But he picked the spot and said, no, this will be fine. Good luck. And over the side she went. Uh, down to try and get some plastic from the bottom of Lake Victoria. Oh, oh it is completely black down there. I can't see a thing. I couldn't even see his hands. It was like swimming in black. The small underwater camera that we gave Ryla was useless. It was so murky. Oh, oh my God, that's disgusting. I think it's another nappy. Every time we went in, we pulled out stuff. Well, that's you, what you don't that's have, what the fish are up against. You don't even have to move far because no, you don't. We, to, like every... we told you that this is going to be Plastic Island. It was revolting. Oh, it's just a tip down there. It's a bed of plastic under the water, and there's soil on top of it. It's already buried. Let's try again. Honestly, each time, without any problem, I was pulling out masses amount, and we were loading the boat with it. Nappies. That's for Ogali. And all of it's disgusting. Industrial waste, chemical waste, personal waste. Everything you can think of, pretty much seem to be at the bottom of that lake. This is a 70,000 square kilometer lake. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake, which we don't know about just yet. The thing is on the top of the lake, you can't see anything. And then just beneath, there's all this toxic waste. I think Tom was right. It was an island of, of plastic. Everywhere you walk, if you look down here, it's all plastic. Look at that. Those are tumblers. Those are straws. When it rains, it finds its way into the water bodies. Kitsumu is Kenya's third largest city, and everywhere you look has some evidence of plastic still. It's just a monumental problem trying to get rid of it. Kenya itself has introduced one of the toughest laws against single-use plastic in the world. In 2017, it outlawed single-use plastic. The plastic bags are a start, but... A start, but it's not everything. Virtually every stall sells these replacements for plastic, which are meant to be more environmentally friendly and are biodegradable. So they have that and that. Very difficult to change people's perception of the use of plastic. But it's better than the normal plastic bags. Kenya had actually made huge strides and instituted very tough penalties for using, for manufacturing, for producing or for selling 
single-use plastics, particularly plastic bags. The problem with instituting a ban against uh, plastic bags is that it opens up a whole avenue where people can try and make money through the black market. We had no idea how many manufacturers were producing plastic bags illegally in Kenya, but we knew they were. So we wanted to get evidence of these actual manufacturers, these producers of these illegal um, plastic bags. Working in Kenya is monumentally difficult. Certain countries are just incredibly difficult for independent journalists to operate. You will find corruption in almost every level. It is very easy to get hoodwinked. It was incredibly difficult to find the actual source of the manufacturing of these plastic bags. We followed false lead after false lead. We were led down, Lord knows how many dead ends. What's going Just on? Just wait two minutes. These things are pretty frustrating. What is it we're waiting for? We met with people who said that they could lead us to the illegal manufacturers, how they were working at night in illegal factories because they couldn't operate during the day. So we did a number of different nighttime stakeouts. Our investigations have shown there are a number of businesses in Nairobi manufacturing illegal plastic bags. We've had a tip off and we're heading off to this one particular outfit, which we understand is making tens of thousands of bags every week. We were chasing our tails. It was really frustrating. We know it's going on, they're producing this stuff, but they were being tipped off. Come on, quickly. We identified this factory, which was meant to be making illegal plastic bags. Alex Crawford from Sky News. We understand you're manufacturing illegal plastic bags here. We burst in. We understood that you're manufacturing illegal plastic bags here. We are not making plastic bags. We just make pipes. It became apparent that it wasn't what it was sold to us. They weren't making any plastic bags at all. Apparently, they used to make plastic bags way back before the ban. All of those plastic bags there, where did they come from? We buy material. Yes. We had to go and say, I'm sorry, we made a mistake. Well, thank you very much for letting us in. Well, it was hugely embarrassing, actually. Oops, wrong place. But that was just a part of the, the slog to get that story. We were so close a lot of times, so we just had to keep pushing and trying and trying. You feel you haven't got that full story that you can tell to people until you've got the evidence at both ends. Emon, 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 Arivas. The head of Kenya's National Environment Agency is Njoki Mukuri. And Njoki is a kick-ass woman. This, this is the raw material. This is what they use for the bags. She is, in no doubt, one of the most mm, impressive yeah. women I've come across. Where do you get this from? No nonsense, mm? great sense of humour. What do you do here? We deal with windscreens here. Yeah? No, you don't deal with plastics. You don't deal with plastics. I want the windscreen. Mm. Not taking any shit from anyone. We should be very daring if we continue to produce after this. The National Environment Management Authority is a big agency in Kenya. Looks like they... Can you imagine a woman in an incredibly male-dominated part of the world, in an incredibly male-dominated profession, getting to the top of that hmm? and running it? This is... Bad. Yeah. Smells this one, we, we, might, we might have to close it down here until they, they do things right. It becomes very difficult to enforce because uh, they are they known tip, to they them. Tip off them. Yeah, they, they tip them off. She was facing levels that you cannot even imagine of police corruption. 
So what happens is that we are forced to do the raids in a very discreet way. We, we don't actually tell them where we are going. Most of the time is that if they get to know that we, are, we want to raid a place, they will definitely inform the people. Time and time again, when we were with her, we'd arrive and they'd already been told that Nemo was on their way and they'd scarpered. They weren't sure when they turned up whether they'd be attacked, knifed, shot, punched, spat at. Uh, that happens, especially with the markets, where we have um, all these small traders that are using the bags, and they are sold in the riskiest places in this town. You know, places that you can't just walk and buy. And it's like a cartel, it's like a network. Like a place like this, when we are coming to do the operation, mm -hmm. we just come and arrest. Let's go and see what's going on. They had no idea what dangers they were going to face when they set out. And yet her and her team were so committed. It's very frustrating. But we'll keep pushing. You see, the team is young, all of us. So we are not giving <laughs> You've up. You've got many more years left <laughs> yeah. in you. To keep pushing. <laughs> They did anything to try and track down these plastic bag gangs. There are a lot of plastic bags here. They're faced with being always a few steps behind the bad guys. The good thing about these raids is that they're very high profile and uh, they're intended to be so that everyone around gets the message that plastic bags are not allowed and will not be put up with. To be honest, I'm pretty pessimistic about plastic pollution in Africa. Every stretch of water, every lake was clogged with plastic of some description. And it's hard to see how that can be undone. It's easy to get overwhelmed by how bad things are and how big the problem is. Plastic is everywhere, but developing nations I'd like to think they have a chance to develop in a, an ecological way and to, to have a better non-plastic future. When you meet individuals like Tom and Njoki, who are real fighters and real devotees committed to the cause, when you see them faced with all of these challenges and they're still continuing, and if they're not giving up, and they feel they're somehow making a difference, then honestly, the rest of the world shouldn't be giving up either because the alternative is death by plastic. Up next, in front of us was this incredibly fast moving sheet of fire. They're going to try and go ashore and see how injured it is. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I was going to get as close as I did. The most important story future generations of journalists will work on is the environment. So, so hot. Within seconds, it was at my legs. Fires, they don't just destroy trees, they destroy habitats. They've just found the jaguar. Now, the leaders of the G7 nations are being urged to put the Amazon rainforest top of their agenda when they meet tomorrow. France's President Emmanuel Macron is leading the calls and has declared the forest fires raging through the Amazon an international crisis. 2019 saw the worst increase in fires in the Amazon for decades. All the indicators were that these fires were up and running again, and yet it wasn't really being reported. The Amazon fires are sometimes started by humans because of ranching and clearing the forests to make ranches, but also because the temperature is increasing so much. The rainforest shouldn't go on fire. It's just too wet. If it's getting hotter and hotter, then it is going on fire and is being destroyed forever. Nossa floresta é úmida e não permite a propagação do fogo em seu interior. The Amazon being on fire is in itself an incredibly important story. 
but to be completely denied made it slightly different as a story that was saying it simply wasn't true and we wanted to prove them wrong. A gringada, eu quero que venha para cá para andar na Amazônia, para ver que aquele trem não pega fogo. É uma mentira o que fala sobre a Amazônia. Everyone says it. And so for me to say it again, you know, it just seems like empty words, but the environment and the climate is one of the most important stories of my generation of generations to come. I think they're the most important stories we do bar none. Brazil is a big country and, you know, we had to do a lot of traveling to get to the Amazon. We obviously flew from the UK to Sao Paulo, then we had to fly internally. It's difficult to get into your mind just how massive it is. You know, long flights on jets and you've hardly moved anywhere on the map. I am um, sending our driver and, and uh, car information to the news desk. But this is going by road? This is all going by road, yeah. And then we're going to charter um, so that we can get a view of the fires from the air. And then your work begins, Stuart. We had a small aircraft that we were going to take to get to São Félix de Jingo, which is, um, it was about a 10 or 12 hour drive from where we were. The view is quite staggering, perhaps more than anything. Staggering because of the amount of rainforest that's been cut down. Staggering amount of farms that you see, literally as far as the eye can see, which should not be there. And then staggering because of the trees just basically breaking out on fire. Marcia is a trusted friend and she's a fantastic journalist in her own right. We have a very similar idea of how to communicate and how to produce. So all these areas, big areas, we, there's an entire the concentration. Right, so that's the fire, the heart of it. Yeah. It was impressive and it was sad at the same time. Further to that, I had a great little adventure because the pilot let me uh, fly the plane. I sort of like heard this like, you know, shuffling about up front and I was like, what? And then, you know, Stuart turned round at that point, what are you going to do? What, what, what's happening? Literally, it's <laughs> I did um, look back and Stuart was looking a bit green round the gills. I didn't feel very good about it at all, to be frank. As we sort of started, um, I don't, I'm not sure the word is, I wouldn't say dive, but drifting to the left and right um, was quite upsetting. You can see the Amazon, it was fantastic. Thank you there. Cameraman, pilot, you know. We wanted to travel to São Félix de Jingu because it was the base location of the firefighters who were fighting fires in the Amazon rainforest for that particular state. She's gear back. Marcia had said, it's only five, and we're like, yeah, okay, yeah, really? It's like, no, but maybe five in one group or five in one section. She's like, no, there are five, five you know, fighting fires in an area we worked out to be larger than Scotland. I'm not so certain if it does indicate a lack of real seriousness and uh, government commitment to fighting the fires in the Amazon because the fire brigade operate out of a crash. Their gear and their one truck is parked up, and of course all their firemen's clothes and socks and pants drying in the sun, etc. And it looked pretty miserable. Anyway, that's what we were talking about, as you said. Yeah. Professional firemen, they're not from the region, they've been brought in to tackle these so-called non-fires, and their job is it's simply hopeless. Well, uh... I think we must have driven for five or six hours. And sure enough, in the distance, you could see smoke. We got nearer and nearer, and we could see that this was a big, big blaze. And they pulled over. 
came out with all their gear on, and we were then right at it. The tools the firemen had to fight these fires were, frankly, pathetic. They had fire beaters, and they had a couple of these water packs that go on their back with a, a, a sort of a pump attachment at the front, like something you would use in your garden. And that was it. The cows were running, and the firemen were trying to get them away from the fire so they would be protected, and I was filming something else. Stuart! Stuart! Over here! Hey, hey. Keep about to miss a brilliant sequence. Richard needs to keep an eye on this guy. He's trying to force the cattle out. Dominique seems to particularly want that, that shot. When we know the fires are driven by deforestation, which is driven by cattle farming, I just thought, what a perfect sort of example of those, all those things in one. She made it fairly clear that um, she wasn't that impressed with, <laughs> impressed with me at the time. <laughs> and I think I made my, uh, my opinion known. I spent the next sort of half hour sprinting up and down these hills trying to, to make up for it. Don't get to my I'm going. Sky had provided us with these kind of fireman Sam outfits. Big, thick, heavy cotton on top of your normal clothes and in that heat. And remember, we had only been in country a couple of days, so there'd been no opportunity to acclimatise at all. And I couldn't get any air in whatsoever. You take that off and suddenly you're right in the smoke. A complete choke. And I got a lung full of smoke, and that clearly affected me. Okay. And so I started to really overheat and struggle to breathe. I might need a minute, please. Yeah. And um, I have to admit, there were, there were a couple of, you know, sharp moments with my colleagues. <laughs> OK, I'm very sorry. Would everyone mind please getting out of my way so I can get the shot that everybody wants? It's not the end of the world. My hands were tingling, my peripheral vision had started to go a little bit foggy. You start making really bad decisions because you're exhausted. I was well aware that this was happening to me and also the fact that you start getting snappy with people around you. That is one of the uh, telltale signs of heat exhaustion. We had to take a little time out, a little break there to let me recover and get my breath back. There is a kind of unseen danger about fires because they move so rapidly and they can change directions. Of course, the closer you get, the more you actually see the colors of the fires, the red, orange flames. And then everywhere you look, just thick, thick black smog from all the smoke. In front of us, was this incredibly fast-moving sheet of fire that would move at the speed of the wind. Within seconds, it was, you know, virtually at my legs. Just have to keep watching. You can't lose concentration. It, it's hot, man. The flames catch up on you really, really quickly. I see a pitch is coming out. It's really fast now. It's not out of control, but they've withdrawn. It's so, so hot. And it's just burning out of the trees. You can see there's, you can't see behind, but there's a huge forest out there as well. The wind is up, it's really dangerous. Really, really dangerous. Does this happen often? Is this most years? No. I've been here since 2009. Que ela queimou toda, mas não foi bem toda, foi só um ano. Os Osana a gente sempre consegue apagar. Só que todo ano dá uma chuva, duas, meio de julho, essa época era para estar chovendo. E esse ano não deu. E esse ano, não, até agora, aqui não choveu ainda. It was his land. I mean, he explained that the fire had started about three or four days before. That he and the guys that he employed had been attempting to control the fires, but each time they got it under control, or at least stopped its spread, and as soon as the temperatures got going again, it would flare up. The professionalism of the farm is remarkable. 
they're taking on these fires, just trying to beat them down. And they are quite impressive and they're quite effective. They can actually stop the fires spreading through just pure physical hard work. But as soon as the winds get up, or as soon as the temperature rises, these fires just start again. You wonder, you know, what is the point? It's really difficult to explain to anybody just how vast the Amazon is. It's huge, and these trees that are centuries old are so high and so tall, it's impossible to get a sense of scale from the ground. A drone is an absolutely essential tool in that environment. As soon as it went up, you know, it was mind-blowing. I'd go as far as saying they were, you know, some of the most impactful pictures that I've ever shot. I knew they were really good. I knew they were really powerful. Bringing the drone back... <laughs> it, it, it basically dropped out of the sky and we lost the drone. I was gutted because I knew what was on there. I was absolutely devastated. We searched for the drone. We couldn't find the drone. I, I didn't sleep much that night. I, I was absolutely devastated about those pictures being out there somewhere. The next day, we were going back to the same area, and while Richie and Stuart went off to film a bit more with the firefighters in a different area of the forest, Marcy and I went to where we were the previous evening. Buddy. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> ah, fantastic. <laughs> While we were searching for the drone, we came across this flattened piece of plastic metal, which was grey, white, the same colour as the drone. But I took a picture of it in case we didn't find the drone. You know, I come out of the trees and I'm full of hope and expectation. I thought, I'm just going to play a little joke on Richie. And Marcia shows me a, a photo of this thing that was sort of drone-shaped but completely melted on the ground. And I was, I, you know, I, I was almost in tears. Yeah, ta-da, showed him the drone. And there was Darren, the drone, and uh, all, all safe and well, and so were the pictures, and I, I just can't explain the relief. Happy, it Richie? Blended in with the drone. Gits. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic, I am, I, honestly. Very relieved. My kids called him Darren when I first got him, and so, um, so that's it. Darren he's been ever since. But once you attach a name to something, knowing that Darren was out there on his own in the Amazon all night, you know, you, you almost, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a tough one. I was worried about him. I felt happy that I found the drone because I felt like it was like a little makeup present over the cattle. Well, the firemen, they're going to need reinforcements. This is hopeless. There's 10 fires that we've seen in there, and then there's this one, absolutely vast. Whole side of a mountain has gone. It's on fire on the other side. There's just not enough firepower here. These guys, five of them, can't take on this number of fires. It's, uh, it's incredible. Back to Sao Paulo and Homer, we've had a bit of a change of plan. We really thought that that was probably the end of our trip, and we were going to slowly make our way back to Sao Paulo to then head back to the to the UK, or maybe even onwards. This uh, largest wetlands in the world, sort of in the centre of Brazil, so it's not part of the Amazon; it's its own thing, but it's on fire. Lots of animals. We feel if we've come this far, we may as well go and do that story as well. It's another huge journey and long drive to get to the Pantanal. The whole trip was about 10 hours. And then we've got a flight to Brasilia and then a flight from Brasilia onwards to our next destination. It is huge, this place, huge. Last time I was here, of course, I was getting on my own plane.
the fires had been going for a while, but this was now much more about trying to look towards rebuilding and to looking after animals that have been hurt. Bye. We saw the volume of animals that were being brought in. I mean, we were there for about half an hour or 40 minutes. And the door kept opening with a new animal that had been injured. And finally, a baby otter. Show stealer of all show stealers. This is possibly the cutest animal you'll ever see. We headed off on a boat with these vets to try and look for jaguars. Over the previous couple of days, they had seen a wounded jaguar down near the water's edge. We headed off in this incredible smoky atmosphere. Jaguars are one of the most elusive creatures on Earth, and, and frankly, in, in the back of my mind, I, I never thought we were going to see one in a month of Sundays. They were worried that if there were too many boats and people around, that the jaguar would get spooked and go deeper into the forest. They wanted to dart it and then examine it. So we stayed back for a little while and waited for the right moment. They've just found the jaguar. We're heading up river to see if we can catch up with the vets. They're going to try and uh, go ashore and see how injured it is. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I was going to get as close as I did. This jaguar, probably eight foot tail to nose, was lying there, you know, growling, grunting. My camera was sort of eight inches from his nose and just hairs were up on the back of my neck and this magnificent creature. But the good news is the jaguar has actually been hunting and uh, is feeding. One of the plans was maybe to have to remove him, but they don't have to, so he's going to be given medicine. And then eventually he'll come around. We're going to leave him, and he's going to be alive and mm -hmm. fine. Great. Yeah. They then gave it antidote. Everybody lifted it up and moved it into the forest. They didn't want it when it was drowsy, accidentally walking into the river and, and getting itself into trouble. That's when Stuart and I and some of the vets and team went back to the boat, just in case it woke up quicker than they thought, while Richie stayed with the vets. I was statue-like, filming this incredible creature slowly waking up and becoming more lucid and getting itself together. Fires, they don't just destroy trees. They destroy habitats. How does it look since your last time you were here? It's devastation. It's in a... I don't know how much the, the nature can restore itself, you know, for how long. I was really deeply affected by what I saw in the Amazon. I think it's a tragedy, and I don't think the international community is doing enough. I don't want to be looking my grandkids in the eye one day and telling them that we didn't do anything. What happens to the climate of the world is by far the most important story that we will ever work on. 
now more than ever, the story of climate change, of what we as humans are doing to the world around us, is the responsibility of all of us to tell. There will be wars over water, there will be wars about development, there will be wars about uh, resources uh, declining because of the environment and its slow drift towards what looks like the tipping point where you just simply can't save places like the Amazon or even the Pantanal. Next time on Hotspots. Fight for Brazil. I return to Brazil as COVID-19 overwhelms the country. And they simply refuse to accept anything needs to be changed at all. We are here to support our president because our president is really tough, really strong. Welcome to America. And my team are in Texas at the heart of the American virus pandemic. War number one is a COVID virus. Number two is stupidity. I couldn't believe exactly what she was saying. You better believe I'm angry. I'm sick of this shit. Until then, you can find us on Twitter at Alex Crawford's Guy and at Ramsey's Guy. See you next time. Ask me.